We're going to start uh, talking about, first of all, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. This is such an important uh, several verses here that we need to cover that is important in hearing God's voice. What do we do with other voices that we're hearing? What do we, how do we discern voices? In this verse, many of y'all probably may even know by heart, but it's so important. And what does it say? It says, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now that's a handful right there of the Word of God, but it's so important and so vital to you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as followers of the Lord. As we walk in our daily spiritual life, these verses are so prevalent for us. And you may think, well, what's that got to do with, you know, hearing the voice of God? Well, through this, we're going to, you know, study how we discern between God's voice, our voice, the enemy's voice. But when a voice is heard in our ears, we have a decision to make. And what decision is that? Are we going to accept it or are we going to reject it? Correct? Everybody with me on that? Everybody in agreement with that? We are going to hear a voice. We hear voices every day. And many of them, we make decisions whether we want to listen to it, we want to reject it, we want to receive it, we want to just throw it to the side, or we want to ponder and meditate on it. Through our daily walk, we are constantly hearing a voice. Now, we've used that illustration through the last two times about when we want to tune in to God's voice, just like we're tuning into a radio, what do we do? We, first of all, we turn the radio on, we get the station we want to get to, because that's what we want to listen to. If you want to listen to Christian music, you know that 103.5 is, you know, Kalo radio station. I know I'm going to be listening to Christian music. If I want to go to another station to listen to country and western, that I need to go to that station. Well, in a sense, in our spiritual walk with the Lord, we have got to know where do I tune in to hear God's voice? Where do I go? Well, we all know where's the number one place to go to hear God's voice. The Bible, the Word of God. You know, we talk about this being our weapon, and it is. But it's also... Are one of the ways that we can hear God's voice. So the Word of God, the Bible, is extremely important to you and I as believers because it's in His Word, just as Pastor Keith used the illustration a minute ago about how the Lord spoke to him, gave him something straight out of His Word about I will never leave you nor forsake you. Straight out of His Word. This is actually then, you would think of this as one particular, if you'll allow me to use that expression, radio station. What would be another radio station where we could hear God's voice? Church. Church. Church among what? Like your spiritual leaders, the mature leaders. We would then be able to hear God's voice, whether it was behind the pulpit, whether a prophetic word was coming forth, you know, whether Pastor Keith one of the elders was talking and, and gave a word and then all of a sudden it quickened your spirit because something they said ministered to you or confirmed something to you or validated something to you uh, that you were waiting to hear from God. And that's exactly, that's another, in a sense, another radio station that we could turn into to hear God's voice. Anybody have another example of another radio station? 
How we can hear from God? Maybe during meditation after prayer. Prayer time? Absolutely. Prayer time. We could be hearing God's voice. We talk to Him, and then He's talking back to us one-on-one. -on -one. Prophetically, the, when the prophetic word goes out, that's another radio station or frequency where we can hear God's voice. But we can even hear it Something that just quickens our spirit that we hear on TV. Or like we talked about the example, the billboard or, you know, someone, uh, you know, that we may be listening to. And all of a sudden, God's voice just absolutely uh, touches you. So, with all of that in mind, in these particular scriptures, one of the things that's so important, of course, is what? There's a battlefield going on in each and every one of our lives, and it's the battlefield of the mind. mind. When, when voices come in, when the words come in, we have to what? Discern, decipher those voices. Okay? So they come in, and whether they come in and we receive it into our, you know, into our spirit, into our heart, which, you know, there's, there's a thing about the heart kind of is the same thing as the soul. And then you've got the mind, the thoughts, that sometimes some say that's part of your soul. But there's ways where it comes in through your ears, into your heart, or into your soul, or into your, you know, into your thought process. But there's a warfare going on in the heavenlies above you, and there's a battlefield going on where Satan is trying so hard to bring static in into your frequency that you are with God and you're trying to hear from God and Satan is trying to throw static in to where you're not either listening clearly or maybe it's throwing you off, the distraction is throwing you off. One of the things that comes to mind uh, rather quickly here is when you read the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, what was one of the things? Daniel was praying to hear from God. And how long did it take for him to hear from God? 21 days. Did Daniel give up? No, he didn't. He was in prayer and fasting for 21 days waiting to hear a word from the Lord. And what did the angel come down, which was who? Who ministered to him? Gabriel. And of course, you know, Michael also came later. But they ministered to him and told him, God heard you what? On the very first day. But why not until the 21st day did he hear from him? Because he said what? Of course, he called Satan that in the word of God, he was called what? The king of Persia. The prince of Persia was battling with them. So there was a war going on in the heavenlies, so, you know, let's just say over Daniel's head, so to speak, where, where God had a word for Daniel and Satan was there to try to intercept, you know, distort. He was trying to get in the middle and, and, and get involved in that. But there was a battle with the angelic realm going on. And then, of course, the boy, you know, the, God's voice, God's message came to Daniel on the 21st day. Now, what's one of the differences for you and I compared to Daniel when we want to hear from the Lord? What do we have as our helper today? We have the Holy Spirit. We can hear from God just like this. Just like this. So you'll know then, because we can hear God's voice with the help of the Holy Spirit like this, there's still a battle going on. And it may even still be where it could be 21 days before we get that, you know, confirmation or that word from the Lord. But the, one of the differences is we have the Holy Spirit within us who is there to help us. And as you and I are in relationship with the Holy Spirit, then we are going to be able to discern the voice, hear God's voice rather quickly. Now, God may choose to hold it back and not tell you right away. Of course he can do that. But there's a battlefield going on, going back to this scripture. I don't want to go too far off. But there's, there's a battlefield going on in, with your mind. 
The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, he also says casting down arguments or casting down those thoughts that are coming to you and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So if there are thoughts coming to me that are contrary to God, what am I supposed to do? Which is what the next thing says. What? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So you can also say when a thought comes at me, then I need to immediately bring it into captivity and say that thought must obey the Lord Jesus Christ or it must go. That is one way the Lord has shown me in years past how I can quickly discern his voice or the voice of the enemy or the voice of my own self. Is because when thoughts are coming in and I'm trying to discern, Lord, is that you or is that not you? Is that you or is that me? Is that me or is that you? Is that the enemy? Who? You know, I will say that less and less now because over the years as the Lord's been helping me and teaching me, Quickly, when a thought comes in, I immediately can take it captive, make it become obedient to Christ. Because if it will not obey Christ, it has to leave. Now, when Satan throws in thoughts, maybe he wants you to say something ugly about somebody or, you know, whatever. It could be a thought about, you know, when we're driving down the road or we're in Walmart in a long line and you're like, man, I cannot believe they're doing all this. And then they're doing, you know, and all those thoughts are starting to come at you. What am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? I'm supposed to take that thought captive and cast it out. Because is that thought of the Lord? Is that voice I'm hearing? Well, you just need to tell them they should go get in that other one because this one says 10 items or less, and I've been looking in their basket and literally I've been counting, and I've done that before, and you, I have. They got more items in there. Uh, I think I need to tell them, why don't you go to the other line? There's people behind me who only have two items. That thought, would that have been from the Lord? No. I got to quickly discern it. I got to quickly choose. Am I going to reset that or am I going to reject it? And then here comes when I say, no, that is not the right way to act. That's not a thought from the Lord. And therefore, I choose not to let that thought have its way in my life, in my mind, in my heart. And all of a sudden, now I'm thinking all these things about this person I don't even know. And I have no idea what's going on in their life. Maybe they have somebody sick at home and they needed to hurry up and get through. And there's so many things that could be happening. But just even in that one little scenario... Listening to a voice, I have to immediately discern whose voice is that. And I can tell you right there, I can just move God out of the way on that thought because that thought did not come from him. So it leaves two other thoughts. Is it mine or is it the enemy's trying to either throw me off? It's my responsibility and yours to bring our thoughts captive. And that's all a part of our responsibility in hearing God's voice, knowing it's God's voice, or hearing it's the enemy's voice, knowing it's the enemy's voice, or hearing my own voice, knowing it's my voice, and what am I going to do about it? And I'm going to bring my thoughts captive. Amen? <laughs> All right. Let's, and, Can I add something to that go right ahead. now? Go ahead. No, go ahead. You set the time no, for the video. Yeah. I had uh, simulated in my mind. Okay. Oh. Okay. You just break it in with me. All right. So remember, I told you when I'm putting these things up here on the video, most of that is on your handouts, but it's easier for me to relay it as I'm going along. So one of the things here, God wants to speak to you continually, every day. Discerning God's voice is not something you will automatically know how to do. It's something we learn how to do as we spend quality time with God, growing in our faith, and getting closer to Him. It takes practical experience, understanding, and wisdom.
wisdom to know if what you're hearing, thinking, or sensing is really from God. And it's important is why I underlined it. Because there was a time as I was being taught by the Lord and I was growing with Him that I would get discouraged. Well, Lord, I, I don't feel like I'm hearing your voice. Well, it's going to take time as you develop, number one, your relationship with Him. But as I, as I spent more time with Him, I began to learn and discern more His voice talking to me, whether it's through His Word or or however many different means. But I had to learn over time how to discern it was his voice. And all of us are going through that. I'm still going through it. There's still things I'm learning and growing as we go along. But growing in our faith is important. Because if you get stagnant and you don't continue to grow your faith and you don't get closer to him, then how are you going to know him intimately? Is that any different from a marriage? You have got to learn to know each other intimately. To know. I mean, how many of us that are, that are married couples, how many of you can probably tell right away what your spouse likes and, and dislikes? You know, what kind of food do they like to eat? What, you know, there's a lot of different things that we learn about the other person as we go along and as we grow with them and mature with them and spend time with them. That's all the process of marriage. And with the Lord, it's the same thing in our relationship with Him. How we spend time with Him, and the more we talk to Him, and the more we fellowship with Him, the more we're going to know Him. And one of the best ways to know Him is to know Him through His Word. Why? Because the Word of God is going to teach you His characteristics. It's going to teach you His attributes. You're going to learn about what he likes and dislikes and what's important to him. What's important to him. And one of the things I'll just say is that I learned that's extremely important to the Lord. It's just one of the thousands of things that he laid on my heart was about the widows and the fathers. I have read many times in the Old Testament where nations were destroyed for the very thing that they neglected the widows and the fatherless. He showed that to me. He told me that. That's one reason why we have the widow and widower's Valentine luncheon. Why is that? Because the Lord was showing me that's how much he cares about them and loves them. That even nations were destroyed for neglecting them. That's one of his characteristics and his attributes of love. And so as I learned that about him, I could feel his heartbeat when it came to that. That's just one. I mean, we could probably name everybody in this room, in your relationship with the Lord, probably have something that the Lord has shown you personally that's important to him. But you and I are extremely important. Hearing the voice of God, I know a lot of people say, okay, I want to learn how to hear God's voice, but they're not willing to pay the price for it. There's a price to pay in hearing God's voice. But what is that price? Anybody? Spending time with him. Spending time with him. I have to say this because I know I heard it for a reason. You know, we talk about how God speaks to us. Monday, I was listening to Robert Morris. I don't know if any of y'all saw him on Monday, but he was talking about relationships and how relationships with the Lord and, and you know, intimate relationships. And I happened to turn it on right when he was talking about the Lord in relationship with him. And he was even talking about, you know, how it had to do with hearing him and knowing him. But it was so, it literally, it, it took my breath away. And I, and I know I'm not going to be able to do it as well as he did. 
and I tried to find it on YouTube, but I guess because it just came out, it's too soon. But for you and I in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are what? The bride of Christ. He is the groom. And he was using the example of him and his wife. And he said, you know, what would my wife prefer? For me to tell her, well, I will always be faithful to you. I will not commit adultery because the Bible says do not commit adultery. So since the Bible says do not commit adultery, I won't do that. And he said, I present that to my wife like that, one way. The other way is, he said, honey, you are the most important thing in my life. You mean more to me than anything. The minute you wake up in the morning, the sun shines bright because of your smile and your presence. And when I go to bed at night, and you're laying there next to me, the stars come out at night in my, in my eyes when I see you laying there next to me. <laughs> he said, I can walk into a room I feel funny saying this as he would say it because I'm there. But he said, I can walk into a room and there could be a thousand people in this room. I only have eyes for you. I only see you. I am only, I am just taken away by you and your beauty and who you are and what you mean to me. And he kept going on and on and on. And I was just like, But you know, and when he finished, he said, that's how Jesus feels about you. That's how the Lord feels about you. But the minute you wake up, he's so excited to spend time with you. <coughs> You're everything to him. He named the stars of the heavens for mankind. He created the beautiful flowers and the trees and all of that for you. He did all these different things to please you because he loves you. You're everything to him. And he said, what kind of husband would you rather have? One that just stands there and says, okay, don't worry about me. I'm not going to commit adultery because the Bible says adult, so okay, we good? Or are you going to want that husband that says, I love you more than anything. I want to please you. I want to do what, what would give you the desires of your heart. That's the kind of husband we want. That's the person the God that we, whose voice we want to hear. That's who we want to hear from. The one that said, I loved you enough to die on the cross for you. My love for you was deep enough. And I didn't want you to have to go through torment and torture because of your sin. I'll do it for you. That's the person. That's the God. That's our Lord that we want to hear His voice. So, relationship is important. Spending quality time with Him is important. Experiencing Him. That's important. Amen? Alright. We have to learn to focus on God's Word and make a determined decision to believe Him more than we believe what we think 
hear, or feel, and what our circumstances look like. This happens as we spend time with Him in prayer, studying the Bible, and then obeying what God shows us. The more you hear God's voice, the more you obey God's voice, then the more He is going to talk to you and fellowship with you. He is. How many marriages out there are where they don't communicate and they don't talk? Is there life in that relationship? Well, there might be, but it's not. It needs some help. Communication, fellowship is what's going to strengthen that relationship and make it personal. Alright, so this is in your handouts. I know that this, this prompt is kind of small there. You will find um, this in the page on the Bible page one. Alright, so discerning the voice of God and the voice of Satan. Number one, God speaks deep within my spirit. The devil speaks to my mind. Why? Because he does not control my spirit. Number, and then A, God alone resides within our spirit. Satan and God cannot both occupy our spirit man at one time. Cannot. Because if you are possessed by the Lord, in other words, he owns you, he possesses you, then he's the one who, what? Habitats. Habitats here. He lives here. He dwells here. He, he, well, I mean, the Bible even talks about he owns us, right? But 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. One spirit. So if we are wanting to hear the voice of God, then as we work towards that, then it should be something that can be what? Accomplished. Why? Because the Lord and I, the Lord and you are one spirit. One spirit. Number two, God's voice is gentle and persuasive. It's free from pressure. Satan is loud and clamoring, always demanding an immediate response. A to that. Number two, God says... This is what you ought to do. Satan screams, this is what you have to do. For us, if there is intense pressure associated with the thought, reject immediately as either your own mind or a satanic, a satanic ploy. Okay? So, how many of you, when you've heard a thought, you know, a voice coming in, and it's very, you know, demanding, very demanding, Almost screaming at you. What does that tell you right there? 99% of the time it's going to be Satan's voice. God is going to be what? Gentle and persuasive. Why? Because he knows you have free will. The Holy Spirit is what? A gentleman. The Lord is going to speak to you gently. And he's going to talk to you about maybe he wants you to do something. Maybe he wants you to change something about yourself. But he's going to do it in that soft, gentle voice. Intense pressure. Is God going to do that? No. Now that doesn't mean, though, if the Lord's been telling you to do something and you're not doing it and he kind of goes... And he's had to do that to me before. He's like, Chris, are you listening to me? But he knows that's how he gets my attention. But I still don't consider it as something that's very, you know, uh, what intense pressure. He just keeps talking to me, talking to me, talking to me until I'm paying attention. Because it's more that I'm not paying attention. And I'm not listening. But God speaks deep within our spirit. Number one said again, the devil speaks to our mind. Battlefield's in the mind. And that's where he's going to try to cause you, to persuade you 
to do something contrary to the Lord. Because if it stays up here too long, eventually what happens is it comes down here. And it's up to you and I. You know they talk about the 18 inches, you know, between the heart and the mind and all of that. And there's definitely a battle going on between the 18 inches of the mind and the heart. And, you know, and, and when the thoughts come in, no wonder the scripture says to bring them all captive. Because if they keep hanging around too long and their thoughts that are not from the Lord and they and they stay a while, before you know it, they've tried to make their home in your heart. Whether it's anger, resentment, jealousy, whatever, pride, some of those things that if they hang around too long and we think about it too long, before you know it, they eventually will start getting right down into the heart. And now there's a heart problem there. That's going to take a little bit more work to get out of the heart. Where when we can immediately take it and take authority over it in the mind before it has a chance to get down here into the heart. Alright. Obedience to God is the key to hearing His voice. Not just occasionally, but as a lifestyle. Why is that important? Because the more we we reject his voice or don't listen to his voice or don't respond to his voice, the more we don't obey his voice, then the less we're going to hear it. Because over time, the voice will get fainter and fainter and fainter by our choice, not the Lord's. But in Isaiah 30, 21, powerful voice kind of going along with what we're saying, the statement that was made, it says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk in it. That's the Lord talking to you and I right now tonight. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walking it. That would be hearing his voice. We use these examples a lot, but it's so uh, true that when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and he says, turn left, when you normally go straight, there's a reason for that. And we have to trust that voice. If you hear that voice, if you're going down Main Street, and, he, and you hear that voice saying, turn left here by the post office. And you normally would have kept going straight. I've learned over time, I don't need to argue about it. I need to turn left. Because God must have some reason for me to go left. Maybe it's to avoid an accident. Maybe it's for a divine appointment. Maybe he's just testing my obedience. And he'll do that a lot at the beginning when I was when he was teaching me how to hear his voice without doubting or questioning. He would just teach me, turn left, and I would turn left. And of course, sometimes I had to find up, sometimes nothing happened. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, I turn left, but I don't see anything. And later on the Holy Spirit would tell me, he says, I just wanted to see if you would obey. You have to learn to obey. And when you learn to obey, then it's going to start coming more and more and more and more because the Lord knows that if you hear His voice, you're going to do it and not question it and doubt it and go through five minutes of me going down the road going, Lord, says you, why do I want to go left? I need to go this way. Walmart's over here. Why do I want to go left? Why don't I go left? I get... All of that is out of the picture. You just turn left. This is the way. Walk in it. And that's obedience. Okay, number three, God's voice produces peace and a sense that everything is under control. Whereas Satan's voice speaks of despair. You've missed it. All is lost. Because Satan is good at telling you, boy, you missed it. You blew it. He's good at telling you things that will what? Tear you down. Where God's voice will do things what? To build you up, to encourage you, to instruct you, to teach you, and yes, correct you. 
Number four, God's voice is always clear and distinctive, giving us clear direction in which to go. The voice of Satan perplexes, causes confusion, loss of direction. Because 1 Corinthians 14.33 says what? For God is not the author of confusion. So who is? Satan is. So when you're hearing a voice and you're hearing the thoughts and there's confusion all about it, that's a red flag to tell you what? You need to stop here and do something with those thoughts. Because God is not the author of confusion. And that's one of the things that Satan tries to do more than anything is to confuse us. So how we discern the voice we are hearing is, is it total confusion? Because if God's going to give you a direction, it's going to be clear. He's not going to say turn left, well, turn left, but he's just going to say turn left. Satan's going to be, well, are you sure you want to turn left? Are you sure God said turn left? Why do you want to turn left? What's going to happen if you turn left? That's not in your, the way you should be going. You were going to go in another direction. Now you're going to waste more time and spend more time. And all this is going on. And now all of a sudden, confusion has come in. He's the, Satan is the author of confusion. So confusion is what? It's literally what it says. Confusion. It's unrest. Disorder. Instability. For us, if we lack clear direction on which way to go, then wait. God does not mind waiting for his children to discern his will. And that's so true. There are times when I have said, as I was learning, Lord, I'm not really sure, is this you or not? Is this you giving me this word or this direction or not? I'm going to wait a minute, Lord. I'm going to wait on you. I want to make sure, especially when it's a major decision. I'm not talking about now going down Main Street left. I'm talking about a major decision. I'm going to go, Lord, I want to wait a minute. Sometimes I've asked the Lord for confirmation. Anybody ever done that? I think a lot of us have. Lord, can you confirm this? Who was the one that threw out the fleece? Gideon, thank you. Remember, he threw, he threw out the fleece and said, okay, Lord, if it's wet, it's dry. The Lord was so patient with him. <laughs> but I've done that many a times. And he was so patient with me as I was learning. All right, number five. God tends to speak when I am seeking and listening for him. Where Satan breaks into our thoughts uninvited. He breaks into our thoughts uninvited. He'll do that. This is the verse that the Lord gave to me. You know, uh, I think I mentioned it where, you know, I was just in the house and all of a sudden I heard Jeremiah 12, I mean 29, 12, 13. And then I just went, Alexa, what is Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13? And she just started spitting it out. But it said, Then shall you call upon me and pray unto me, pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me, and you shall find me, when you shall seek for me with all of your heart. And the Lord spoke to me. And it blessed me beyond measure, because only the Lord knew that I was having some thoughts going on, not saying anything out loud. I had some thoughts going on because about this class and and last week as I was studying and, and I was just talking to him about some things. And he gave me that verse. And that was his conversation back to me. On that particular moment and that conversation that we had. Number six, God's Spirit convicts of specific sins. Leaving no doubt what needs to be confessed. Satan and yourself speaks in generalities. You know, we try to, you know, we try to, when, when a thought comes to us about, you know, sin or whatever, and, and we know that we've committed a sin, and we try to either justify it or 
or kind of spread it out to where it's not such a big sin and we just go on and on and on and on and on where God will convict us of the specific sin and get right to the point, does he not? Amen. Amen. I can vouch for that. I, I have a t-shirt. God is very specific and he will tell you, Priscilla, you should not have said that. Now, he's very specific to where he even says, you should not have said that to your husband that morning when you woke up. Now, Satan's not going to get like specific like that. Why? Because he doesn't want me to, con to repent of my sins. He doesn't want me to confess my sins. But God is so loving and kind, and the Holy Spirit is such a good you know, helper, and then he's going to tell me what I need to take care of, what I need to deal with, a specific thing, a specific sin. And that specific sin could be anything and everything. It could be a little lie. It could be, you know, a, a thought coming up that was prideful or whatever. There could be so many different things of a specific sin. But God is going to convince you specifically, whereas Satan's going to try to bring in confusion and, and all of that to speak in generalities, okay? And then A says, God says, yesterday at 3 p.m., you spoke unkindly to this person. B, ever been confused when you just know you should be confessing something and you just can't name it? Maybe at times like that, you should just start praising God for his awesome mercies. Sometimes I just have to start praising the Lord. When confusion starts coming in and and now thoughts coming in of trying to justify, well, the Lord, I had every right to say, I mean, I had every right to come back because did you hear what he said? Well, Lord, I, you know, and all of a sudden, now all this is starting to come in, and I'm having a conversation with myself, and the Lord's probably standing in there letting me know when you're finished because I already specifically told you that I heard his voice, what I did wrong, and I'm supposed to then deal with it. But instead... I'm trying to justify it and say, well, but Lord, I mean, my gosh, he started it. I learned a long time ago through Joyce Myers and her, her story about her and Dave. Oh, boy, the Lord had me watch Joyce Myers and Dave. And now I know when he used to say, now, Joyce, well, Lord, you know, Dave wanted me to fix him a fruit salad and I was busy studying your word, Lord. And she's going on and on and on and on. And the Lord said, as you have made that fruit salad for Dave, you did it unto me. And he told her about so many different things. <laughs> oh, well. But the Lord helped me. Those stories of Joyce and Dave. Because in the long run, when they would argue about who was the actor or actress on this movie, and she would say it's one thing, and they'd say, no, it's somebody else. You know, it's not, it's this one. I know it is. It's Clark Gable. No, it's not Joyce. It's so and so. No, it's Clark Gable. And they would argue, and the Lord finally would say, Joyce, does it really matter? Is that really important to your salvation and to your walk with me and your relationship with me? And, in, in the peace in your heart and mind to be right or to know you're right or say you're right and to keep arguing does it really matter and here's what I learned Lord I don't want to stand before you in heaven and not want to make that right because I wanted to prove it was Clark Gable I know it was and when I stand before the Lord is that even going to be a matter is it going to matter at all But how I responded to that conversation is going to matter. But see, it's still going on about hearing his voice because God's voice was telling me, be quiet. Be quiet. Does it really matter? Now I'm still learning and I'm still working on that. Amen. I'm still working on it. Still working on it. But I am trying to be there. Okay. We can know when God is speaking to us. His voice is that still, small voice that you hear in your inner man. The voice of God bears witness in our spirit, and we usually have an immediate peace. 
His voice is encouraging, and it draws us closer to Him. God does not speak condemning thoughts to us, but leads us gently to repentance. When He shows us a problem area or sin in our lives, it is always for our good, and it never brings hopelessness or despair. So when you're hearing a voice, and that voice is telling you about hopelessness and despair in your life, is that God's voice? No. And of course, that helps us to discern. Because God's going to have that gentle voice that's going to lead us to that point of repentance. Or lead us to that point of correction. Or lead us to that point of encouragement or direction that He wants in our life. Thank God that we have the Holy Spirit to help us to discern the voice and the thoughts coming in. But it's that still, small voice that we hear deep in our inner man that we know, that we know, that we know it's the Lord because it bears witness to our spirit. It bears witness. All right. John 10, 27. We've said this verse before. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When stop works quickly. What does that what does that scripture mean to you? Somebody want to say? Tell me what does that verse say to you right now in your spirit? What are you hearing when you hear that verse? Would you actually have a relationship with them? Yes. Protects you. Good one, too. Yeah. This is important because the Lord wanted me to put this verse up here because He said, I want to speak to my children tonight through this verse. What is the Lord saying to you in that verse? Well, the one thing He says clearly to me, Him being a shepherd, He will never lead you astray. That's awesome. What else? Listen. Listening? He already knows everything there is to know about you, so there's nothing that you can't tell. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you don't think that you know his voice, that's a lie. When you what? A lot of people don't think that they hear his voice, that's a lie. That's a lie. Yeah, it's good. Anybody else? If they hear my voice speaks to me, um, I don't have to see him with my eyes. Else? It's amazing he even wanted me to put that one up with that picture. Because that picture is what spoke to me too. You know, just seeing that and thinking that good <laughs> because when I saw this, he said, these are going to be the people that are going to be in class tonight. And that's me. And I want them to know how much I love them. And the fact that you know that he's not turning around and looking like this all over the place. He's, he's at peace walking this way knowing that you're following him. You're right behind him. That's what he was telling me and showing me why he wanted that particular picture. But anybody else? Anything else the Lord is saying to you through that? Okay. You know they say that she I have a tendency to wonder, or we need somebody to guide us. Does she? I saw a, a video on YouTube of a, it was a flock of sheep that were just wandering out there aimlessly. And the shepherd did something with the little girl there. She said, call the sheep. And they ignored her. And he said the same thing as she said. And when he spoke, they came running. <laughs> so that, that makes me think of, they hear my voice and they will follow me. That was a beautiful illustration of the little girl trying to get them to come and they wouldn't. But when the shepherd spoke, they came. Actually, in, in, in real life, sheep, if you have two shepherds with two flocks of sheep and they actually meet each other on the road and all sheep mingle and get together, they will actually separate from the voice of their shepherd. Wow. I mean, they may all, 50 and 50 may get to be 100, and one shepherd makes his sound or noise, 
his fifty will go with him. Yeah. And the other shepherd can speak in his fifty. And it's just him. It's their nature. Yeah. Yeah. You know what just came to mind when you said that? The story of the sheep and the goats. And how there's going to be that separation of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are going to know the Lord and they're going to go with him. And the goats are going to what? They're going to follow their shepherd, Satan. But the one thing that really stands out for me is this one word right there, too. No. If you were to study that in the Hebrew, it's more than just no. Because you know how many times in the Bible where it talks about like Abraham knew Sarah, which meant what? He's talking about intimately. Very intimately. You know, I can honestly say I know Patsy. Okay, but if this was her first time here, I couldn't say that. She's just someone that happens to be sitting here. And I, you know, I, I know of her because I maybe have met her tonight or whatever. But I can honestly say I know Patsy. I know her. And so that, that changes our relationship from her coming in the first time in the door and sitting down versus now. I know Patsy. And so with the Lord, can you imagine how much that's even... Excel, if I could just use that word, advanced, that with our with the Lord knowing us and us knowing Him, then we are going to follow Him and not think anything about it, not question it. And the fact that the Lord can be going in this direction and not have to keep looking back because He knows that we're going to follow Him. He knows that. He's comfortable with that because He knows us. And he knows that we're going to follow him. And that's important to him. That's awesome. All right, real quickly, for time's sake. Eight ways to discern between God's voice and Satan's voice. And I think that starts on uh, page two. Right in the middle. But I'm just bullet pointing some things. Number one, God gives clear-cut directions, whereas Satan speaks through confusion. Number two, Satan speaks, when he speaks, it pushes us into being impulsive. He's going to push us to, to get ahead of God. You know, he's going to push us to be impulsive and maybe say something we shouldn't have said or do something we shouldn't have done. Number three, God's voice will line up with his scriptures, and it will. Yes. Say, I mean, God's voice will line up where Satan, what? Number four. Satan's words are lies or half-truths and cannot be backed up with Scripture. God's Word speaks to our spirit and we can discern His truth through His Scriptures. Number five, Satan speaks uh, to our soul. And when I say soul, I'm talking about the, 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 thought, the thought man, the soul man. The seed of our emotions is what I mean when I say that. Our will and intellect. His voice is demanding. It's loud. It brings fear, anxiety, and worry. He can make us feel guilty to the point of justifying instead of confessing our faults and making corrections. Number six, being in God's presence and reading his word will help us to be able to discern his voice from others. And that's so true. How are we going to ever discern God's voice if we never spend time with Him and reading His Word because it's going to be backed up by His Word? All right. Talking about His Word. And then this verse, John 8, 31, 32. This is Jesus talking. He said, if you abide in my Word, and what does abide mean? To dwell, to live, to reside. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is what? His word. And the more you read and study his word, the more you are going to be free to discern his voice from the enemy's voice. Does that make sense? 
The truth shall make you free. Why? Because the truth is what's going to tell you where Satan has been lying to you. The lies of the enemy. They're going to be, they're going to be well known, their lies, because you know truth. And the Holy Spirit is also known as what? The Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit's not going to steer you wrong. He's going to speak truth. Jesus came so that you would be free. And it's the truth of His Word that's going to give you the freedom to be able to know it's His voice or whether it's the enemy's. Because His Word abides in you. On our hand, Abby. Oh, John Aker. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Thank you. Don't give me that correction. Thank you. All right, number seven. Satan usually magnifies a problem and tells us we must solve the problem ourselves, bringing heaviness, stress, and guilt, which is not our burden to carry. Anybody guilty of that? I am. There's some times when all of a sudden there's a burden really heavy on my heart, and I think that I have to solve it. And I worry and stress and, and all that when the Lord's like, well, you're going to give it to me. That's not for you to carry. That's not your burden to carry. Satan is going to be the one to tell you, you're the only one that can solve this problem. You need to figure it out on your own. Why? Because he doesn't want you to run to the Father. Number eight, God leads us gently where Satan pushes. God's thoughts are calming to us. All right, and then real quickly, y'all have this one on your uh, last page there. Yeah, page four. Some of the ways you'll be able to discern God's voice from Satan's voice. Number one, God's voice calms, whereas Satan's voice obsesses. God's voice comforts, where Satan's voice worries. God's voice convicts where Satan's voice condemns. God's voice encourages where Satan's voice discourages. God's voice enlightens where, God, where Satan's voice confuses. God's voice leads where Satan's voice pushes. God's voice reassures where Satan's voice frightens. And God's voice stills where Satan's voice rushes. Satan wants nothing else to push you and rush you and be impulsive and do things that are outside of where God has the plan and purpose for you, the will for you. He wants to get you out of God's will. And so when things are impulsive and pushy and, and you're getting anxious and stressful and all of that, the Lord's not going to put that on you, or He's not going to tell you things that are going to put you in that state. All right, and I end it with this. When armed with the truth of His Word, we are able to contend with the onslaught of fear, doubt, and insecurity, negativity, and lies that the enemy hurls at us daily. All right, when we're armed with the truth of the Word of God, then we're going to be able to more quickly discern the voice of God, discern the enemy's voice, and even discern our own voice. The more you read the word, the more you're going to be able to discern the voices. And so next week we're going to do some demonstration of hearing God's voice uh, through scriptures and journaling and so forth. We're going to do that next week. But uh, anyway... Uh, I'll leave that up if you might want to write that down. The five questions with us out loud so we can write here. These five questions? Yes. Oh, um, I don't have my answer, but number one, what does the scriptures from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 tell us as Christians to do to bring our thoughts captive? And this is where you would just fill in uh, what it's telling you as a believer to do, to bring your thoughts captive, which is what we discussed earlier. So real quickly, what were some of the things that we could do to bring our thoughts captive? Hmm? Cast them down. Cast them down immediately. When those thoughts come in.
come in, we needed to serve. Is it God? Is it me? Is it the enemy? And if, and if they will not be obedient to Christ and His Word, then we need to cast them down. Number two, what is a key to hearing God's voice? What's the key? Spending time, Spending time is what? Obedience. obedience. But of course, obedience is spending time with Him because He tells us over and over and over again to abide with Him and, and so forth. All right, number three, what is one of the greatest footholds that demons can do against you? All right, and that answer is in the middle of page three. I have it bullet pointed. One of the greatest footholds demons have is being able to plant what? Thoughts into your mind. That's one of the greatest struggles they have is when we allow them to put the thoughts into our mind. And you'll notice when it's Satan's voice, he usually changes it to I. In other words, well, I was offended. Well, I was neglected. Well, I, you know, was this and that. Satan will tend to do that to where he turns it to I, 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 I. All right, number four. If God's voice comforts, then what does Satan's voice bring? Yeah, absolutely. And number five. Complete this scripture. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I, and, and they will, 